I used to wonder to myself, how am I meant to write about art when it's just so personal and subjective? I could almost write about anything. Now, the truth is there are ways that you can write about art. And the best way really is to focus on art elements. Art elements are the ingredients in an artwork. They're just the basic properties of an artwork. Color, line, shape, form, tone, texture, even sound, light, and time. And the reality is it is impossible to create an artwork without including one of these art elements. By nature, if you have made art, you have explored these things. You perhaps just haven't analyzed it. So we're gonna spend this video analyzing the different properties of art elements so that we can learn to write about art and just simply look at and enjoy a good artwork. Now, what is color? This might seem super, super basic to you. And the truth is there's really three ways in which we describe color. First one is hue. Now hue really is just the name of the color, whether it's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, every color has a hue. It's just a fancy word to name a color, right? Value though, is the lightness or darkness of a color. So every color will have a value. Even as I look at this artwork, this is a highly saturated work, but it has some dark areas and some light areas. And finally, we have intensity. Intensity is really the richness or the boldness or the dullness of a color. An example of intensity can be seen here by Paul Klee. He's got some high intensity areas where it's quite rich and colorful. And he's got low intensity areas where he's added a lot of water to the watercolor paint and it's really just washed it out so it's more white. Another thing we should be considering when we look at color is actually, it's worth really implanting a color wheel in your mind. And so when we think about colors, we have primary colors. Now, primary colors are the red, blue, and yellow. These colors never change. And it's worth being aware that those primary colors can never be mixed. They are the basic colors of paint. And essentially these colors would be used to create every other color within the color wheel. So for example, if we look at this artwork by Jacob Lawrence, you'll notice that he has mainly used primary colors to capture this highly saturated and almost youthful looking aesthetic quality within an artwork. Next, we should know complementary colors. Now complementary colors are really just colors that are on the opposite side of a color wheel. So, Complementary to orange would be blue. Complementary to red, we even see in this artwork by Ando Hereshik, something like that. Anyway, complementary to red, we have green. And what that does is it creates a sense of contrast within the artwork. Next, we have analogous colors. To find a pair of analogous colors, simply choose two colors that are touching on the color wheel. So, for example, in this painting by Vincent van Gogh, we have a blue and a green, which are right next to each other on the color wheel. And what this has done within this artwork is it's created a sense of unity in the whole, and it's really created a sense of balance within his painting. Another thing artists do is they select a color palette to communicate a mood and feeling. Dorothy Tanning here, for example, has contrasted warm colors with cool colors to show the clash of rest and restlessness in insomnia. Now, warm colors, a good way to remember warm colors is actually to think about your shower tap. If it's hot, it's red. If it's cold, it's blue. Warm colors are on the red side of the color wheel. So they'll be the reds and the oranges, and they capture a sense of warmth within an artwork. Cool colors are on the blue side of the color wheel with blues and greens, and they often make an artwork feel cold. For example, Pablo Picasso went through a series of painting blue paintings, and that's even where that term came 
where people said, I've got the blues. Because the blues might be sometimes sad or a little bit depressing, whereas warm colours tend to have that sense of homeliness and warmth. Line is an element of art defined as a path of moving point throughout space. Now we look at this artwork and we can't really see lines within it. However, lines are implied within the direction of the painting. The direction of a line can dramatically alter an artwork. Diagonal lines create movement and energy, whereas horizontal and vertical lines add stability and strength in an artwork. In this example of directional lines in art, the artist uses both diagonal lines that can be seen here, and this creates energy and excitement within the scene, whereas vertical lines show strength. And we can also see that this creates a sense of focal point. We notice that all the lines point towards the same area. And then this is reinforced by the direction of the blade, which really gives a very kind of downward weight within the artwork that we're looking at. Another type of line is contour lines. Contour lines form the outside edge of three-dimensional shapes and clearly define the area it occupies. So if we look at this work by Michelangelo, there is actually a lot of use of contour line that create that sense of three-dimensionality that really exaggerates the shape of the form we're looking at. And you'll notice that these contour lines actually thrust our figure into a space. So there's this recession backwards because of the contour lines. Now, these are a great way to make an artwork look three-dimensional. And it's really worth considering when you are creating your own artworks. Another form of line is gestural lines or gesture lines. This artwork is a great example by Katakowicz, and please excuse me if I'm mispronouncing her name, but Katakowicz uses very rapidly moved, rapidly drawn lines, and this creates a lot of energy in her artworks. You can do the same by just being very free with the way that you use your lines in your own artworks. Another type of line is implied lines. Implied lines are not made by physical mark in the artwork, but rather they're visually suggested. So this example by Grant Wood, he has created this sense of implied line that creates a focal point. Take a moment to look at this artwork and consider where is the focal point? What is the, and the main thing that everything is pointing towards? Now, what I see is actually everything is pointing towards this hatchet. This is reinforced perhaps by this ladder that even points to it, by a hand that's pointing to it. Even this hand is pointing to it. Now, this is super obvious. Even the shadows point towards that region. And what that does is it creates a sense of structure in the work and it helps to communicate an idea or meaning. This is something artists often do just to draw our attention and emphasize a focal point. Another form of line is expressive lines. This artwork by Edvard Munch, he has used highly expressive organic lines in the background that contrasts with these sharp kind of, these are actually called orthogonals, but they're um, di diagonal lines that recede into the background. And that creates a sense of energy within the artwork. Shape is also a significant art element. This artwork by Picasso uses geometric shapes. A good way to think about geometric shapes is perhaps even think about if you were studying geometry, you would be looking at the different angles within shapes and perhaps even measuring them. Now, in the same way, Pablo Picasso has over-exaggerated the geometry of these shapes 
to create almost this very industrial look. This art movement is kind of, it's actually called cubism. And he almost turns these forms into cube-like structures. This contrasts with organic shapes. Organic shapes are free-flowing organic forms similar to what you perhaps would see in nature. Form is an element of art that is very closely related to shapes. Now you might have shapes here that are very two-dimensional, but when we are looking at form, we're turning those shapes into something that is three-dimensional. We can see, for example, this artwork by Dali uses geometric shapes to create a sense of form. And so he's using spheres and he's actually darkening some areas, lighting up other areas, and that creates a sense of value. This is a way of making the shapes within the artwork look three-dimensional. We also have organic forms and geometric forms within an artwork. Classic example you can see on the screen here, these are clearly organic forms that look similar to what you might find in nature. Now, funny enough, we've made a lot of reference to value already. We looked at the value of color that creates a sense of a tint or a shade within, a, uh, within an artwork. And value really is a way of describing the lightness or the darkness of an area. Value can also be used to reinforce the three-dimensional look and create a sense of form. This artwork here has tints where the colors are very light. So we could see, for example, these white areas are tints, but there's also shades where the colors become very dark. So if we look at this artwork by Dürer here, he's using cross hatching and stippling in the artwork to create a sense of form. What is cross hatching? Glad you asked. Firstly, cross hatching is when you put lots of different lines together and overlap them. And what that does is it creates a sense of form. You'll notice this area looks a bit darker than what it was over out here. And that's because the lines are closer together. The other thing is stippling. Now stippling is essentially when you put lots of dots very closely together and compare that to dots that are further apart. Now this is almost like a really zoomed up version of what we're seeing in this artwork where there are lighter tones here and there's darker tones here just simply because the dots are really close together. Next we have texture. Now when we talk about texture, we have tactile or actual texture. Now that's just a fancy way of pretty much saying this texture is real. If this was a real artwork, you can touch it and it's super furry, right? But we also have implied texture or visual texture. And we can see this on this artwork where if you were to touch it, it's actually probably gonna be smooth. But what we're seeing here is that he has created a sense of texture or even furriness, right, visually. So it's become an illusion. I mean, in pasto painting here, what would this be? This is actually tactile texture. And the reason why is the paint is applied really, really thick. Whereas painting with this sort of oil painting technique is actually done with very fine brush strokes and is quite smooth. Finally, we have space. Space is really concerned with the depth that's depicted within an artwork. Now, strictly speaking, it's just worth being aware if you're in year 12, for some reason, the VCAA consider space to be an art principle. However, a lot of sources would consider it to be an art element. It just means don't refer to space as an art element in your exam. Now, to create a sense of depth within this artwork, the artist is using overlapping. Now, overlapping is done perhaps, you know, where this arm overlaps on a body and that creates a sense of depth. There's foreshortening. Foreshortening is 
when there are areas, perhaps even this hand that is larger than the face there, I should probably use this sort of cursor, you can see the hand is larger than the face. And the reason why is, you know, even this elbow compared to this elbow is because it's receding into the background, right? Relative size, very similar. We see perhaps this person standing up is a lot bigger than, say, this person in the background. And so that creates the illusion of depth and also perspective. Now, there are different ways to capture perspective. One I'll show you in the next one is using lines to create that sense of space. So again, we're seeing an overlap of these art elements. Now, this is called linear perspective, where there are linear lines that point towards a vanishing point. And do you see that everything points to here? And what that does is it creates a very balanced, symmetrical, harmonious artwork where everything is unified. It also means everything has that sense of depth that was really invented during the Renaissance. Finally, we have atmospheric perspective. Now, you'll probably see this a lot with photography where the background would be blurry and the foreground would be quite sharp. It's just fascinating looking at this artwork by Bruegel because this was done 1565 and he was already using the sense of blurriness in the background and sharpness in the foreground. And that gives you a sense of an atmosphere. Finally, we have positive and negative spaces. Now, this is pretty simple. Positive is actually the object that's depicted. Negative tends to be the space within the background. And often artists will reinforce that negative space to heighten the drama within the artwork look at. So hopefully this video has given you some tools and now you're going to be able to understand and write about art by analyzing art elements.